three, two, one. Love Talk Radio. You know, honestly, we have so much fun behind the scenes before the show even starts. And it's great because it gets a good energy going between Richard Flint and me, your host and co-host, Dr. Deb Carlin. Now, no apologies. We're not apologizing for what we talk about because it's all about what we're concerned about for ourselves and for you. There's stuff going on out there, people, and we want to talk about it. We want we want you to think about it and feel about it, but not get out of your mind or have your heart leap out about it. It's about critical thinking skills and being reasonable and being a little bit explorative because, you know, we both have got that behavioral, human behavior, human condition credentialing that we engage in. So we understand people in the human condition, don't we, Richard? You know, you're right, Deb. And one of the things that is important to me is that uh, our listeners don't let anybody anybody pull their human spirit down and that we we remain strong in our our beliefs and in our trust and in our faith yes and we don't buy into what's being thrown out there right now because you know i say this every time and every tuesday i think what's really under attack today is the human spirit i think everywhere you look what they're trying to do is they're trying to escalate the fear Mm-hmm. which then strengthens doubt, worry, and uncertainty. Yeah, and uh, we just can't let people do that. We can't let that happen to us. You know, when you and I were talking this morning, you had said that one of the things you really wanted us to talk about today was what has this meant to you as a year of your life? And we don't take callers in. This is, ne- this is a live broadcast that's recorded and so it gets distributed afterwards. And I wanna explain to our audience why it is we don't take callers. I don't take live callers because when you're gonna do that, and especially when there's not a time delay, the person who is speaking is live. And I've had the experience, even when I did have an engineer on this show, is um, you get people who come on and, and, and you have no idea what they're gonna say and there's a lot of inappropriateness and I don't want us to have to be editing the show and, and assaulting people's ears while it's live. So um, we don't take live, live calls, but what we do is we, we listen and, and we're gonna be making more available to you a chat area where you can come in and you can, you can chat about what it is that you're thinking. Um, the technology here on Block Talk Radio has shifted a little bit, but we'll be able to do that. And on our YouTube channel, which is Partners in Excellence Media, you can leave comments. And I'd appreciate it if you would go there and subscribe to that channel, because then we have greater bandwidth, more people hear this, and we can offer you a whole lot more. So going back to the issue, you know, 2020 has indeed been a year of uncertainty. And it's been enormously impactful, not just for people in America, but around the planet. So today, Richard and I are going to talk about what has it meant for both him and for me this year of our life? What has happened? What has it meant for us in terms of this year? Do you want to go first? Well, I know that for all of us, this was not a year that we anticipated. Yeah. Uh, because for me, I was totally looking forward to 2020 uh, because I had um, my calendar filled with bookings, uh, speaking engagements, and I was excited about them yep. and had uh, spent a lot of time getting ready for them. And, you know, January, February, and the first part of March were just awesome months of opportunity. Yep. And then, uh, someone opened the closet door and pulled out a big eraser. Yeah. And um, what was left of my year pretty much got erased. Yeah. And uh, so this has, been a, this has been a year of challenge for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been a year of reflection. Uh, 
and it's it's been a year that's brought some elements of fear uh, because of the unknown. Deb, I don't think any of us can face the unknown without having to deal with some form of fear. Right. And fear to me is is always a test mm -hmm. of strength. Mm -hmm. um, fear to me is not always negative. Um, fear is only negative when uh, you buy into the doubt, the worry, and the uncertainty that fear brings to your life. Right. But if you can see fear as an opportunity, because fear that feeds off of doubt, worry, and uncertainty speeds us up. And the faster we move, the bigger the mess we make. Um, but when fear slows us down, it causes us to have to examine. And examine is not always bad. So I wrote down six things that this year has meant to, has meant to me. Oh, fabulous. The first one is the number of mixed messages I had to interpret. Mm. Uh, we have talked over and over again about who in this world or in this country today do you believe? Uh, I mean, I, I listen and I listen and I listen and I hear contradiction after contradiction after contradiction. And how do you build trust when you don't know who to believe? How do you do that? I mean, is it possible? Or does the fact that you don't know who to trust, does that, in, does that increase our skepticism? Mm. And as our skepticism increases, you know, it's amazing how that affects what we listen to and how we hear what we're listening to. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and this has also been a year for me where the expectations that I had laid out for my year <laughs> had to be put under a time of how do I adapt these? Can I? What adjustments am I going to have to make? Which meant I had to do a lot of rethinking. And then it forced me to have to realign what my year I had I had laid out was going to look like. Um, is that tone on your side, by the way? Is that I'm sorry? An, is that an alert that's coming across on your computer, by the way? Yeah, it is. It comes from um, it comes from um, outer space. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh, there's a group of Martians up there that are talking to me. Uh, they're talking in my ears. You you hear a dean, and I hear the voices. Uh, They've been with me for a long time. I mean, Just in 2020, is that part of what 2020 has meant for you? <laughs> yeah. They've been asking me if I want to get out of here and join. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go. Don't go. Yeah, they want to beam me up. No, don't go. I need you here. Yeah. And in 2020, I had to also create a new business model. Yeah, me too. And you know, when, when, you've, when you've spent years, 30 years developing something and every year improving it, improving it, improving it. And all of a sudden, because of something out of your control, the model that you have created mm -hmm. won't fit into the new in environment. Right. So, you know, there's a lot of stress involved in that. Yeah. Because yeah. You, you don't want to take the model and throw it away. Right. Because you, you know that maybe down the road in just a little ways, this model will come back and you'll be able to reapply it. Yeah. So what I've had to do is take the model that I've been using it, been using and ask, okay, how do I adapt this? Mm -hmm. And, you know, creating is easy for me. Yeah. Uh, adjusting it to the environment is challenging. Yeah. And then when it means I have to realign everything that I have done and come up with new processes, 
Uh, that's a lot of work. That is. And you know, I, I don't know about you, but it it causes me to sometimes sit back and ask questions. You know, I, I've worked real hard to get to where I am. And do I want to start this all over again? Right on. Yeah. And then you then I lean back and I ask myself, okay, what is it that you really want for your life? Is this crusade that you've been on in your mind, is it over? And my answer is a very quick, no, it's not over. What is the crusade, Richard? To help people understand the process for their life to become better, to become smarter, and to become stronger in their life. You know, I, I think most people have a lot more capability than they understand. I agree. And hallelujah for your crusade. It's a really good one. Yeah. And I think most people are, I think most people have the, have the ability to be better than what they are. Mm -hmm. I think they can be smarter. I think they can be stronger. I agree a hundred percent. And, but why is it that people who have potential deny their life, the potential? What is it? Is that rhetorical or do you want me to tell you? You tell me. Okay, I'll tell you. What number are you on? Did you go through all six or are we pausing here? You're on number four, aren't you? I'm on um, number three. Okay. So just as a, as a segue, as we're talking about that and our audience is engaged, wondering, it comes down, it comes down to basic trust. You know, I, I believe that love, I love it when people put their hands together and make a sign of the heart, you know, make the shape of the heart. This I think is is beautiful because what it what it really indicates when you put your hands together like this is, and for those of you who can't see, I've got, you know, my two hands come together, they're they're bent in the direction of one another. The fingers come together to make the top of the heart, and the thumbs at the bottom are the bottom of the heart. That is that is a true uh, physiological transmission of energy in me from the left side of my body to the right and the right to the left. And so I'm, I'm, you know, using both sides of my brain and keeping that balance together. I clap my hands and I engage all my nerve endings in my periphery and solidify in my central nervous system and reactivate my brain. Why do I do that? Because I want to be in my head and in my heart. And I want to know this is terrain that I can absolutely trust. When everything else in the world is untrustable and uncertain and I'm skeptical, I do not want the fear to overrun me like a big wave in the sea. I wanna be grounded and I wanna be centered. What do I trust? Well, if you listen to Jean Piaget, a developmental psychologist, he was amazing, an amazing man. And he wrote about the stages in life and the very first phase of life, he says, is you either learn trust or mistrust. Now, not to worry if you, as an infant, learn to mistrust because of the ways that you weren't attended to. You can, through appropriate channels, come to learn to trust. But if you start out with trust, it's something that you start out knowing. I started out with trust. It's very clear from my family heritage and my story. So when I come upon things that cause me to be uncertain and I feel shaky, I know it's because I'm being visited by that monster demon that is the part of me that's vulnerable. And instead of being grounded, I feel like I'm in an earthquake and I'm shaking, I'm quivering. And it's unsettling. What we don't like as human beings more than anything else is volatility. So when we ourselves are volatile, you know, like I looked in the mirror earlier today and I was calm and I was relaxed and now I feel all jittery and icky. Well, I've, you know, that's volatility. I don't like that. I like to be consistent in my frame of mind and not stagnant, but I want to know that I can count on me. So when people are skeptical out here in the world and they're looking around, they're trying to figure out what they can trust, please start with the self. You know, Richard and I both have all kinds of materials 
if you Google our names that are going to guide you into the pathway of being able to learn that inside of you, it is beautiful terrain. There's nothing to be afraid of. Go into the bathroom or into any mirror and stare yourself right smack in the eyes and look and see your soul and tell you, I love you. You are right there for me always. And know also that our creator is right there. What created you is right there in your eyes, in that mirror, in that reflection. We don't need to live in this extreme fear, but trust is at the core of it just as much as love is always an essential component to any solution for any problem, anywhere, anytime. And those are those are the two the two themes that I absolutely am firmly entrenched in. Well, I think the reason most people don't, and I, I, I don't agree, I don't disagree with anything you've said. Yeah. But when I get down to the core of why people who can decide not to, it's because, you know, I, I think most things that we want to do with our life um, begin with curiosity. I agree. I mean, I think we're curious creatures. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's delightful. Yeah. And curiosity is a, um, is a doorway. Um, I agree. And it, it's, it starts. But the challenge is curiosity um, is based in a moment. Okay. Okay. And that moment um, how do I say this? That moment is driven by a, a point of excitement. Yep. You ever been to a rah 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 meeting? <laughs> I've not only been to them, I've conducted them. <laughs> Shame on you. Uh, but, you know, uh, curiosity can become a manipulator. It can, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I remember when I used to go to some of, some of these multi-level marketing meetings <laughs> right. that I was speaking at. That's the rah, rah, rah you were talking of? Yeah. Yeah. Where they get people, they get their excitement built up. Right. And they present this picture that inside me, I know is not real, Yeah. but I want something so much better for my life. You know, I believe that most people are bored with their life. Really? Yeah, I do. And, and that's why they accept the circle of sameness. And they're bored with their life and they really want something more for their life. And I believe that that's a driving force. And, and so curiosity becomes a part of that. And so all of a sudden something is created that creates that moment of excitement for them. And that moment of excitement sort of in that instant relieves or releases their fear. And so they're all they're gun ho i can okay. do this okay i like that so is it a distraction or is it a breakthrough well most of the time it's a moment that can't be sustained oh really yeah i mean i've seen people man you know they're there in that rah rah moment man and they're just filled with energy they don't drive home they carry their car home and, and the next day they get up and the car's sitting on top of them. <laughs> Moments of energy are important. <laughs> yeah. But they've got to have a foundation of purpose to them. Indeed. And curiosity is a doorway to a moment. And that moment's important because it, 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 excitement opens up creativity. Yeah. yeah. But here's the thing that I've learned, Deb. If, if excitement doesn't mature, it dies. Oh, my gosh. A horrible death. It well, really, it, it, it's so damaging. 
You know what I draw the analogy to is it's the people do that. They have hope and then it's dashed. And every time you get hope and it gets dashed, it's worse. It's a sin to give anybody inspiration and hope and opportunity and then leave them flat and not help it actualize. It's horrible. It diminishes the human spirit. It, it makes you untrustable. See, it, it, the, word, the word excitement to me creates energy because in the human mind, it creates a picture of possibility. Yes. Yeah. And not every possibility is a possibility. Right. But if I, if I don't have a reason to hang on to that possibility, if all I have is a moment of energy and I get out of that environment where that energy is just flowing, man, and everybody is up and everybody is, you know, is believing in this and we're all gun ho about this. And then we walk out and we're alone to face ourselves. It's hard to sustain that excitement. Yeah. Because possibilities take a plan. And when, when I look at human behavior, those people who rise above curiosity and actually do something with what they found, they have moved from the world of excitement to enthusiasm. And enthusiasm to me is not where I buy into what I've heard, but I can actually creatively see myself being able to do it. And enthusiasm is, is one of those things that feeds passion. Mm -hmm. It's enthusiasm is something that supports a dream. And enthusiasm is energy that keeps rebuilding itself because of baby steps. Um, you know, I believe little successes are more important than big successes. Uh, I think success is the ability to put one foot in front of the other, even if you trip. Yeah. Yes, fortitude and determination are absolutely essential. I agree with you. Well, it goes back to my three Ds that I think are the, the internal food uh, that we have to have to be able to, sus to sustain positive energy. And that's desire. I mean, desire is, for me, is what feeds me every day to continue to learn. I was just talking about desire last night. Yeah. And when I, when I lose my desire, I step out of the classroom of learning. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people step out of the classroom of learning because it's not happening on their timetable. Yeah, right. Exactly. It, it's tougher than what they thought it was going to be. Right. Yeah, so absolutely. Yeah. But desire is nothing without determination. And determination to me is where action creates resilience. I mean, I you, and I, yeah, you and I have both had times in our careers where we've had the rug pulled out from under us. Oh yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know what's interesting? We're the ones who pulled the rug out. We just bent over and pulled it out. Yeah, I know. I could just, you know, I could just kick myself for those times when I did that. It was a perfectly nice rug. I could have been standing on it for a long, long time and been completely comfortable, but nope, yanked it out. Didn't even realize it was my own rug. Yeah. And by the way, have you ever really tried to kick yourself? Yeah. Yeah, I have actually. Mm -hmm. I tried a couple of times and fell down. <laughs> I hung on. <laughs> I was able to make contact. It didn't feel good. But desire and determination can't survive without discipline. Yeah, oh, that now. Yes, exactly. And that's what most people lack. Yes, I know. Yeah. You've, you've, listen, this is so good that we're having this conversation. So, 
<laughs> so are those the three D's? Discipline, yeah. desire. And order. Desire is first. Desire. Determination. Determination. And then the glue that holds those together is discipline. Yeah. I love that. Well, I'll tell you. So I do this reading group with this lovely, lovely group from um, one of the parishes that I belong to. And I, and I lead this group. And the, and the book that we're reading is about St. Ignatius and the Ignatian way, the Ignatian process of discernment. And so it is about sitting quiet and thinking things through. And he has a process. And it starts with a desire. And then it's about the determination. And then it's about the discipline of practicing it every single day. And it's a beautiful process. Do you think desire is something you have to continue to feed? I do, because I think it's a core of, you know, the emotional, passionate, uh, soulfulness of the human condition. Yes. Do you think, do you think desire is fed by um, continuing to be a student? Well, I'll tell you what, I'm serious. We had this conversation last night. I wasn't I, there. <laughs> yeah, I know, you weren't. I was wondering where you were. Um, so the book that I'm referring to is called God's Voice Within. And it's, it's written by Mark Thibodeau, who is a, a, a Jesuit. And what he says is, great desires are so much a part of Ignatian spirituality that they call for a more thorough treatment than other characteristics of consolation. And then he goes on, he goes on to talk about the ways in which desires are about dreams. Well, I love the idea of dreams because in, in the night when we don't have all this stimulation out here, the mind really comes to life. You know, our, our, our body uh, beneath our neck, lower than our neck is busy in a cleaning. Our organs are cleaning, they're resting, but the liver and the kidneys in particular are kicking into gear at two and three in the morning and making sure that things are, are in, in preparation for the dawn of a new day. But it's just like Freud wrote about the unconscious when he was talking about the dream state. You know, the world is darkened out. We don't have the visual field. For the most part, it should be quiet. And we're not up and moving around and engaging. And so the mind, the mind is so happy. It, get, it gets to travel around in there. We've got the whole universe in our skull. I love it. I love that I love that our brain is encased in this wonderful container. It's not like our brain is in our butt. You know, we can sit on it, we can fall on it, we can squish it. <laughs> our brain is protected. And the whole universe is and you can go anywhere in your brain. And if when you go to sleep, you think to yourself, you set it up. People tell me they either don't dream or they get nightmares. You can set yourself up for dreams. You just Focus on it and say, okay, you know what we're going to do tonight? We're going to go to a wonderful place and attach to our desires. What do we want out of this life? It's something wonderful. Let's do that. What's the difference in your mind between a dream and a fantasy? A fantasy is the thing that puts, you know, the twinkle in your eye. The dream can do it too, but the dream is a fire in your belly. It goes from the dream state in your head to it lands in your heart and then it burns a fire in your belly and you've got to get it done. And that is, that is true living. And that is the entrepreneurial spirit, by the way. Yeah. But the fantasy, fantasy is that little twinkle and that's all you want. You just get off on the twinkle. It's like the people who go to the rah-rah meeting, like they'll be at an MLM. Okay. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can make $10 million this year. Yeah. Let me go. All right. Yeah. I'm going to buy everything. And then they never do anything with it but they got off on that moment. That was fantasy. They never actualized it. 
See, a fantasy, a fantasy to me is a sketchboard without a box of crayons. There you go. Yep. You, yep. That's right. You can, you can take a pencil and do the outline. You're not filling it in. It's never going to get, it's never going to get beautiful. It's never going to turn into a real picture. And a, a dream to me is a sketch pad with a big box of crayons. Ah, you like crayons, don't you? I like color. Yeah. I like color. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when you dream, are most of your dreams in color or black and white? It varies, actually. How about for you? My, most of my dreams are in color. Yeah. Because, and, and this is me, this is not you talking or anyone else, this is me. I think the brighter the colors, the more belief it creates that you can. Uh, I love that. I like, well, rainbow. I like rainbows. Oh yeah, they're beautiful. Well, see, I think it. So, what's the important element of a dream? What it is that it means to you? You know, what your affect is, um, in the middle of it. So, for me, I love black and white movies. So, I'm delighted when I dream in black and white because it takes me to another era that I really love. You know, Myrna Loy and William Powell and Clark Gable and Cary Grant and all those characters. Do you think that dreams are a constant pathway to crossroads? Yeah, I do. Because I think that everything in life is actually very intentional, and very purposeful, even if we don't recognize it as being so. Yeah. And, and do you think that sometimes we get, we get down because the, the point of the, when we start the sketch of the dream, we feel like it takes us too long to get to the crossroads. I mean, I, I know people, you know, it's sort of like, it's sort of like my learning center. It was a five year dream. And there were times that I got really frustrated with it because it wasn't moving fast enough. But the reality was that I was wanting something that I wasn't ready to create. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes the challenge with people with dreams yeah. is that they want this dream, but they're not willing to create it. So if they're not at a point to create it and they continue to push it, it turns into a fantasy. Well, I'll tell you what, as you're running through your list there, I hope on numbers one through six, that what you have is that this year has meant to you the completion of that learning center because this year afforded you and, and, and pressured you and inspired you to put that together because you had the time for it and boy, did you see the need for it. Yeah, and dreams to me demand revelations. And what I mean by that is dreams demand you being able to see connections beyond where you are right now. Mm. Because if I'm in my dream and I can't see how I'm going to connect this to the future, then that dream loses part of its power. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in a dream, it just means <laughs> you need to sit down and shut up. Let it, let it happen. And be, and be able to be willing to listen to what's going on around you. And you know something else, Deb, and I think we've both been here and a lot, maybe people who are listening to this uh, have been there too, that sometimes our dreams get stifled because we're lacking that person who brings the next puzzle piece to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, just like with my learning center, uh, I, I was stifled because I couldn't find anyone who could help me make, take this and make shape out of it until Troy walked in. Yeah. And then Troy all of a sudden, um, who was an introdu introduction to my life. And at first I thought the, the guy was really strange <laughs> uh, because he thought outside the box. Yeah, right. But I needed that outside the box. He sure did. He is and, strange. And it's a good strange. Strange mm -hmm. meaning unfamiliar to you and in a different paradigm. So he could create what you created, which is in a very different paradigm. 
Funny how that works. Or as they say in Britain, oh, funnily how that works. Well, strange to me is anyone who can't understand what I already understand. <laughs> okay, are we at number four? Oh, shucks, we gotta go on. We um, gotta do the list, otherwise our listeners go, what? Okay, number four, uh, what 2020 has meant to me uh, was the fact that nothing has seemed to change. It's just been a continuation of more of the same. And that in this year, as much as I, I've, I've wanted to see resolution, all I see is a political agenda to keep us at where we are. And I'm not a person who can function well in sameness. I'm not a person who functions well when I, 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 I can't see the pathway forward. And for I think for a lot of people right now, the unknown has put a door in front of them they don't have a key to. Mm. Okay. And What's you have to learn how to pick the lock. <laughs> What's number five? Oh, shucks. Um, <laughs> well, this no, is, I mean, I'm pressing it because I really want to know. Okay, there's really only five of these, and this is the last one. Okay. Uh, the unknown, uncertainty, and the lack of direction has it made it has made it challenging, challenging for me to really be able to help people. Aww. Because when you take people out of their comfortable routine, or you shake up a human life, yeah, people are challenged to listen. Yeah. And what needs to happen right now more than anything is that people need to slow the pace down. They need to take a deep breath, become patient, and listen to what's being said around their life. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, and this is the challenging part for most people because it goes back to something you keep saying over and over again, and that is that people don't understand critical thinking. Right. And most people, most people accept they don't challenge thought. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so true. And you know, I tell you something, if I accept everything I hear, I'm a mess. Because to accept everything I hear, I have to give up individuality. So that's my five. You want to hear mine? Let me think. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Well, a lot of overlap. And I will tell you, the last one is, is actually my first one. Because when I first started hearing what was happening, actually, a year ago, I mean, it was, you know, before the new year that we were seeing things on television about people in the apartment houses in China screaming to one another, are you okay? And they were in lockdown and I'm looking at it thinking, yeah, this is not good. This is not good for China, but this is not good for the entire world, starting with America. And, and then we started hearing about this virus and I thought, yeah, you know what? Not thinking about the germ. I'm thinking about the social psychology of this. And the social psychology of this is really going to be bad. And as I look at it, the thing that I find so incredibly disturbing is that I hear people talking about the science of, the science of, the science of. And I think to myself, and I've asked people, what do, what do you mean the science are you talking about scientific method? Well, yeah, science. No, there's a practice called the scientific method. You come up with a hypothesis. Do you understand? The scientific method is a methodology that every scientist, every single different discipline that conducts research must follow the scientific method. And you have to either demonstrate that your hypothesis is correct or it's, or it's not. And so you have to set up what you're going to do. Now, you know, 
and people say, well, but we've been told to do these things. Yeah, you have. You've been told to do a lot of things in your life. But did your mother and father ever say to you, if all the kids say, let's go up to the roof of the building and we'll run as fast as we can to the edge of it and jump off, are you going to go? No. You need to think critically about what it is they're proposing and why. And the most frustrating and quite frankly, the most heart aching and breaking reality for me is that my fellow Americans and people around the world, but my fellow Americans, people who I know, love and trust and have always held in high esteem have allowed fear to come in so deeply. It's crushing. It's really crushing. I mean, I have I have walked around my home this year and and cried. I mean, wept about what has happened to my fellow Americans. What has happened to my country? What has happened to the human condition and the human spirit here? <clears throat> we can, we're not allowed to do the things that sustain us. We're not allowed to go and congregate. And they give you these, the government gives us these bits and pieces of, well, you can have 20% of your congregation there. Okay, well, we're so thirsty for it because you locked the doors that we're going to go. I won't participate. I will not I will not play a, 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 a hand of cards with a partial hand. You cannot play the game that way. So I will not participate in that. The, the, the rules about we're gonna have restaurants open but only until 10 because then the virus comes out at 10, at 10 01, is that what happens? Somebody explain that to me because that, that is, is, what is the science behind that? What's the methodology? So we've gone through this, this year of, of masking, which is not healthy. You are breathing in carbon dioxide and you're breathing in fibers from the masks that you're wearing and no one's talking about that. And I'm waiting for the litigation that starts with people with mouth issues and uh, esophageal and lung issues from this constant chronic masking. I see people riding their bikes with a mask on, driving in their cars alone with their masks on, and it just, it hurts me. And we, we also have got this social distancing, and, and there's two things. I mean, everything about it crushes my, my heart, and, and I do a lot of exercises to uncrush that, because I do hear what I say, and I need for my heart to remain healthy. But to counteract all that. But when I see photographs and videos of infants in the hospital, newborns in the nursery, in their little cribs, and they're masked, no. This is what we call insanity. These, these babies need to breathe and cry and exercise their lungs and not be muffled. They need to be able to see the people who are coming to lift them. This is when a tremendous amount of imprinting takes place, learning nonverbal behavior. And people have got these huge masks, not just over your face, or your mouth and your nose, but over you know everything but your eyes. And then sometimes people have them up so high you can only see a portion of their eyes. It's not healthy. The other thing that we've done is we have, I mean, first of all, why don't we put those babies in the rooms with their mothers, you know, just bring a little crib in there and put them with their moms. You don't need to be doing stuff to them away from their mothers. But the other part of this that is the other end of our, our culture is the, is the other end of the lifespan. And that is at end of life, when people are in their senior years, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, people in their hundreds, and we put them in these removed facilities, which I, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a fan of under any circumstances, extreme as that might sound. We don't do that with newborns, but we do it with the elderly who are just as vulnerable and understand what's going on and yet can't comprehend it. We hold them off. You can see your family through that window. Don't open the window. Oh, well, you know, we understand that this is not very compassionate. Everybody needs a little touch. We put up a plastic wall. You can hug each other through the plastic. People are dying of heartbreak. I'm hearing about it. I'm seeing it. I'm reading about it. And it's sinful. And people are starting to 
uh, rebel against this reality. All of this has made a dramatic turn in my life. And it is, by the way, why it is that this platform was born. You know, I went, I went back uh, in, in uh, this last year to the K Factor and I was just doing interviews here and there and doing episodes on my own by myself and talking about kindness. And then I thought, you know, I'm really lonesome. I need, I need to have really good people who I know, love, and trust. I want them here doing a show with me, and I want that partnership once a week. And then I thought, well, this is really getting kind of groovy. And then I developed the Partners in Excellence Media, and I'm filling up the slots and having people um, pay to play here and marketing people and marketing people who I deeply believe in. And, and I'm feeling the energy of inspiration and hope and clear thinking. And we're here without a mask on. We're here each in our own zone, seeing one another in full face, which is beautiful and offering it to our audiences and getting full audio to them and full visual to them. And I believe that this is a rescue, but the other part of it has gotta be, and by the way, we're global. The other part of it has got to be that we've got to figure out ways to come together to say, no, no more. This is enough. No, we will not agree to do all these things. But here's the real danger. And I heard this this morning. I, I turned on the news for a brief period of time. Maybe it was last night. And this man who is, who is in charge of health and human services is on being interviewed. And he's saying, the, the reporters are saying, so... You know, since people are getting vaccinated, you like, then once you get the vaccine, you don't have to mask or social distance, right? Because, you know, you can't get it, you can't spread it. Well, no, we don't have the science on that. So we're still asking people to mask and social distance. Okay, when is it you're going to have that science ready? And by the way, when is it that you're going to really know what the effect of each of these vaccines is? And by the way, so when you sign up to get the vaccine, you don't get to pick which manufacturer you're getting it from because there's some real interesting data about what the ingredients are and what they do to you. So you don't have a choice. But we're going to give it to the leadership first. How do we know that that's what they're getting? I don't believe that the leadership is actually getting these dangerous vaccines. You think they're giving a placebo? I do. You've got to get millions of people vaccinated and they've got to be compelled to do it because they're seeing people get it and not have adverse effects. There have been adverse effects. We've seen it. We've seen that. Well, okay. but there's always going to be an adverse effect in some people to anything that they take. Absolutely. It's always going to be not, a reaction. But we're not going to see the long-term adverse effects for a long time. You've got, they had to, they had to, they had to stagger that so that we could get the, the millions of people to do it. And then you'll see. And then in the meantime, the people who aren't getting the vaccination will be ostracized and shunned, not allowed. This is a terrible tragedy for the entire world and it has to stop. So are you suggesting stop the vaccines? I am suggesting that people um, understand the reality of how long it takes to test and really know <clears throat> the veracity of something. I'm also asking people to pause on this vaccination and look at what the virus is and is not. Well, and, and now it seems like that we're facing something different, like in, um, in England, the mutation of the virus. And by the way, the guy from HHS this morning slipped and said what biologists, virologists know, but there's thousands of mutations of it. It's like a flu. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember the first time I got a flu shot, it was one shot. And then a couple of years later when I got, I got it, it was uh, to vaccinate me against five different types of flu because of the mutations. Right. And, uh, you know, um, but this is the whole thing about this year, Deb, is that, you know, 
Where has trust gone? Well, while we were all busy living our lives in this beautiful capitalist country, things were happening to unravel it. Mm -hmm. And when you were talking about things staying the same this year, actually, this is called the demantling of America. This is called the disintegration of capitalism. And this is called the transition into not socialism, communism. So have you? are you saying that we as a nation have been so busy being busy being busy that we haven't paid attention? And I'm number one standing first in line saying I am guilty. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, even though even though their behavior didn't warrant it, we have still put trust in people. Yes. Because we didn't pay attention to the behavior. That's right. And now all of a sudden, uh, you know, behavior has become the, cr the critical aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, because all of a sudden we're seeing agendas. And because of everything that's being pushed at us, um, we're actually opening our eyes and our ears and we're seeing the contradictions between what people say and what they're doing. And to me, Washington DC has just become a giant cesspool of contradictions. You know, I hate to say this, but <clears throat> you and I are both, it's, it's funny because the labels don't make sense anymore. You and I are both actually liberal. We're open-minded. And we're very conservative because we believe in core American values. And we've talked about the difference between Mr. Biden and Mr. Trump. But I have to tell you, Mr. Trump is, is still um, a disappointment. You know, Mr. Biden is scary and Mr. Trump is a disappointment. That the, the things that haven't been done for the Americans, I don't want to hear about federal policy. I want you to step up and be a leader and do what you have to do to protect our cities. Some of our cities are never going to get rebuilt, Richard. Some mm -hmm. of our companies are never going to come back. The people New, York, are New York City will never be New York City again. No. Mm -mm. Neither will Chicago. Yeah. Neither and, will uh, Portland or Seattle. Yeah. So let's 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 turn the table here. We've got about six minutes left and here's what I wanna do. We have created a tremendously disparaging picture for people, but here's the other part of it. This platform is part of what came out of this. Our solidification of a friendship and a, biz and a business relationship has come out of all this. Your learning center has come out of all of this. We've gone from hopeless to hopeful from scared to inspired, from fearful to motivated with desires. And, and we need our listening audience to tune into us and be here with us and really want that for themselves, their loved ones in our future, our lives. We've got all kinds of patriots in this country um, on the left and on the right who want our freedoms. We want America and we want, we want to be able to live and breathe. And we can, and we need to, and we need to pay attention to the pockets around the country where that's taking place. Well, this is why next Tuesday, I'd really like to see us talk about from our own personal viewpoints. What do you and I feel is the answer for us to be able to breathe in 2021? Okay. What's the answer? I mean, and sure, it's just you and I. But somewhere, someone needs to begin to lay a foundation. Yeah. You know, this is why uh, in January, I've dedicated two Saturdays. Yeah. Uh, to two different, very, very powerful uh, virtual programs that I think are part of the foundation. And on the 16th, we're going to talk about uh, this whole concept of goals. Everybody says you need to write goals. Mm -hmm. uh, but goals in reality become one of the biggest sources of frustration for people. Right, exactly. And yeah. so we're going to talk about a process of how do you turn your goals into gold? How do you get your mind to not only wrap itself around it, 
but creatively visit it every day with a box of crayons. Mm -hmm. no, and no. then on the 30th, we're going to talk about, you know, preparing to have the greatest year of your life. And I'm going to lay out a plan that to me will help you to control the doubt, the worry, the uncertainty, and build a foundation of belief, trust, and faith that the winds of life cannot lock, knock over. Let me tell you something. Friends, people out there who are listening, you know, we've taken you on a journey of complete and utter honesty with no apologies. And we're ending this episode just like we'll end every single one of them. And Richard just laid out two beautiful things that he's doing for you in January. So, you know, dial in, go to richardflint.com and, and join us on these journeys. Wherever Richard goes, I'm going. And wherever I'm going, I'm inviting him to come along with me and come with us because what we're doing is magnificent and come back to this channel every day because there's an episode for you here at Blog Talk Radio and over at our channel on YouTube under Partners in Excellence Media. We want to fill you up <laughs> and have your dreams become a reality and have you feel so inspired and hopeful. And you know what? When we're relaxed in that, our solutions will come to us about what do we do about the world situation in, this, in the situation in America. Yeah, and Deb, let me just remind the people of the six things that we ended last week, last Tuesday with okay. about what I feel that we have to do today to stay strong. Okay. Well, you got to stay spiritually strong today. Yep. And people who don't have a spiritual foundation, uh, they're, they're very easy to manipulate. But if we have that spiritual foundation, we got to stay spiritually strong and we got to pace ourselves. Yeah. We can't get caught up in the moment. Right. Uh, the third thing is you've got to invest in yourself. Yes. And that was one of the reasons that I think with everything that happened, why the learning center got postponed uh, to launch for three months because it was the right time to do it. And then you got to be resilient. Resilient, yes. Love the word. And then you got to involve the right people in your life. Yes. Number you know, five. you have said this to me on several occasions yeah. that uh, during this time, you've had to eliminate people out of your life. You've had to say bye bye. Exactly. Too loose. So long. And then the last thing you have to do is train yourself to be OK being you. There you go. On that note, you're beautiful. You're a beautiful human being, Richard Flynn. It's my, it's my hair. It's your whole persona. <laughs> Air included. Everything about you. You're fabulous. This is fun, Deb. I enjoy these Tuesdays. I do too. I look forward to them. They're wonderful. You know, friends, <clears throat> Richard and I both have big brains. We use them all the time. Big hearts. We pay attention to them. And we have a lot of love and a lot of information to share with you. So if you're ever offended by anything that we say, I would invite you to entertain the idea sincerely that it comes from a place of real love and concern for human beings, for humanity, and for you. Hey, and we, would, we, would love, we would love to hear from the audience. Absolutely. I mean, they can reach me at Richard Flint, Richard at richardflint.com. And where can they reach you? Deb at drdebcarlin.com. Yeah. <laughs> we, invite, we invite you. Talk to us. On that note, we will see you again on Tuesday. Ta. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Goodbye.